18-year-old Gail Schultz had a caring soul and a love for the arts. She enjoyed playing the ukulele, composing poetry, and creating visual art, whether it be sketching portraits or creating watercolors. She graduated from Nazareth High School in 1952, but did not go into college or get a job. Rather, she stayed home to help care for and teach her younger brother, Paul. Twelve-year-old Paul Schultz Jr. went by the nickname Butchie. He and Gail were technically half-siblings. Gail's mother had passed away when she was very young, and her father, Paul Sr., got remarried to a woman named Claire, who later gave birth to Butchie. While Claire was Gail's stepmother, she by all accounts loved Gail as though she were her own, and Gail could not have loved Butchie anymore, regardless of the fact that they did not share a biological mother. Butchie was unable to attend school. More recent news articles have suggested that he had some form of autism, but the exact nature of his special needs is unknown, largely because of a lack of understanding of and ability to diagnose specific conditions in individuals with developmental delays at the time. In the 1950s, special education was largely unavailable, and since Butchie could not attend standard classes, he could not go to school. Gail was convinced that he could still learn, and in addition to taking care of Butchie, she did her best to educate him as well. One of Gail and Paul's favorite things to do was walk along Black Rock Creek, which ran behind their house on Mitchell Avenue in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. The family had only lived in the home for about a year, and had moved into it because their previous home, more centrally located in Nazareth, did not have very much outdoor space for Butchie to play. Gail and Butchie liked to collect rocks, and Gail would challenge Butchie to try to find the shiniest rock along the creek. On Saturday, March 7, 1953, they left home around 2 in the afternoon to go out to the creek. They first stopped at a friend's house to ask if he wanted to join them, but he could not because his father had asked him to clean their basement. Gail and Butchie then went on to the creek without him. Multiple people would later report seeing the two of them at the creek, but no one would see what happened to them next. Claire Schultz became concerned that her children had not yet come back inside within a few hours. Gail and Butchie would normally have already been back inside to warm up and get ready for dinner. Paul Schultz Sr.'s main career was working as a draftsman at Binney & Clark, a crayon manufacturer in the nearby city of Easton. However, he also repaired televisions and radios as a side business, out of a workshop he maintained in the basement of his family's home. That day, he and an assistant, Robert Howells, were working on a television in the workshop. Around 5.20 p.m., Claire called down to him and asked him to go outside to call Gail and Butchie home. Paul then went outside, but received no answer when he called out to his children. He then walked closer to the creek, which was only a few hundred feet away from the house, to look for them. Robert Howells began packing up his tools when Paul went out to look for Gail and Butchie, and was taking them out to his car when he heard Paul scream. When he looked to the creek, he saw Paul pulling Butchie from the water. Claire was in the kitchen at the time, looking out the window, and watched as her husband pulled her son out of the creek. Paul had discovered both of his children, face down in the ten inches of water in the creek. Gail and Butchie's autopsies would later estimate their time of death as 2.30 p.m., not long after they left home but Paul would later say that his mind could not comprehend the possibility that his children were dead when he first found them. He immediately began trying to resuscitate them. Robert Howells had run into the house and called both the family doctor and the local ambulance for help. The crew of the ambulance also tried to revive the siblings and transported them to the Nazareth Fire Company for further medical assistance. Even after Gail and Butchie were finally declared dead, no one yet realized the manner of their deaths. It was initially assumed that Gail and Butchie had both died as the result of an accident, slipping, hitting their heads, and falling into the creek, where they drowned. This was not an outrageous assumption. The rocks near the creek would be slippery under normal conditions, and the temperature had been just below freezing for much of the day, making ice a potential risk as well. Gail and Butchie were therefore taken from the fire company to a funeral home in Easton, 
rather than to the coroner. However, when the funeral director began preparing their bodies, he realized that the head wounds Gail and Butchie had sustained were too extensive to have been caused by a simple fall. He recognized that the bodies would require full autopsies, and the police were finally notified of the siblings' deaths. At the autopsies the following day, it was determined that Butchie had been struck in the head three times, and Gail had been struck seven times. She also had a compound fracture on her thumb, which was believed to have been a defensive injury. The blows appeared to have come from a hammer. Both siblings had water in their lungs, indicating that they had still been alive and breathing after they were put into the creek. The police investigation into the murders faced numerous challenges. Authorities were not notified about the crime until 9.40 p.m., more than seven hours after the murders occurred and four hours after the bodies were discovered. They could not properly search the crime scene because it was dark by the time they were called in, and several inches of snow fell in the early hours of the following morning. Gail's glasses were eventually found 40 feet away from where her body had been discovered in the creek, but not until nine days after she died, after the snow began to melt. A chisel with a plastic handle was also eventually found at the scene, but forensic tests showed it would not have caused injuries consistent with those found on the siblings' heads. The crime scene was also highly contaminated. The ambulance and the doctor's vehicle had been driven back to the creek, and dozens of neighbors had come out to the scene after Gail and Butchie were found. Gail and Butchie's distraught parents had to be investigated as a matter of protocol. They were interviewed at least three times in the days following the murders, and were given lie detector tests. Claire and Paul were cleared of involvement. There do not appear to have been any insurance policies on the siblings, but Gail was the beneficiary of a $17,000 trust established by her maternal grandmother, Minnie Romilly, which was to eventually be paid out to her in three separate payments. However, the trust specified that should Gail die, the payments would instead go to Zion Lutheran Church in Easton, meaning that there would be no financial motive to kill her at the time of her murder. Police theorized early on in the investigation that Gail and Butchie had been killed by what they described as a sex maniac, although there was no evidence suggesting a sexual motive. Gail and Butchie's cousin, Barry Isle, has theorized that his cousins may have instead been killed by someone who was upset by Butchie's behavior. Butchie did not speak in the way most people do, communicating in moans, screams, and grunts, rather than typical speech. Someone who did not understand that Butchie had special needs could have been angered by the exaggerated noises he tended to make. Barry Isle had been just nine years old at the time of his cousin's murders, and had frequently gone down to the creek with the two of them. They had seen a homeless man near the creek the week before Butchie and Gail were killed, and Barry has speculated that this man may have been involved in the murders, but this remains just a theory. There was a lot of public interest in the case, which helped keep the investigation active. Tips were called in about suspicious individuals and unfamiliar cars in the area at the time of the murders, but none of the tips panned out. Various groups and businesses donated money to create a large reward for information, and the local newspaper hired a private investigator and a criminologist to help with the investigation. Despite all the efforts from the police, the family, and the community, Gail and Butchie's case went cold. Paul Schultz Sr. died of a heart attack a year and a half after his children were killed in September of 1954. Claire Schultz then moved to Buffalo, New York to live near her son from a previous marriage, but was buried near Paul, Butchie, and Gail in Pennsylvania after her death in 1970. While little progress was made in the case in the ensuing decades, Gail and Butchie's memory has lived on in Nazareth. In 2011, classmates of Gail's and other alumni of Nazareth High School raised more than $2,000 to purchase a monument for Gail and Butchie. It was placed near the stadium on the campus of the larger Nazareth Area High School, which was built the year after their deaths. In 2013, several of Gail's classmates worked with her cousin Barry Isle to compile a scrapbook of memorabilia about Gail. The 50-page scrapbook contains newspaper clippings about her death, 
but also many of her art pieces and articles she had written for her high school literary magazine. It is being housed in the library of Nazareth Area High School, and plans are made to digitize the materials so that a DVD could be produced and sent to every school in the district, as well as the local public library. The Pennsylvania State Police maintains a file with over 400 pages of information about Gail and Butchie's case, and periodically hears from the public about it, but they have not made much progress in solving it in several decades. Timothy Alioth was a decorated Vietnam War veteran who served in the United States Marines from 1967 to 1973. His time spent serving along the DMZ left him with post-traumatic stress disorder, which eventually led to him becoming a completely disabled veteran. In February of 2009, 59-year-old Timothy was living with his sister, 62-year-old Donna Plew, in her home on East Indiana Street in Vancouver, Washington. He had moved there from Oregon after Donna's husband died in September of 2008. On Friday, February 6, 2009, Michelle Kraft and her husband, Keith James, arrived at their adult daughter's home on Indiana Street to pick her up for dinner at 7.15 p.m. As she was walking out to the car, their daughter heard three loud noises she feared were gunshots. As the family drove away, they happened to glance over towards Donna's house as they passed it. They saw a pickup truck that had been backed into the driveway. Its driver's side door was open, and a man was lying on the ground, with his leg up against it. A woman lay on the ground in front of the truck. The two people on the ground were Timothy and Donna. They had each been shot in the head, and did not survive their injuries. Each of the siblings left behind children and grandchildren. Donna's quiet neighborhood was not usually the scene of any kind of violence, and her neighbors were shocked by the crime. Police quickly came to the conclusion that the murders had not been random, and that Donna and Timothy must have known their killer. Unfortunately, no one witnessed the killer leave the scene, leaving police without a major lead to follow. Wally Steffen worked in law enforcement for 36 years, eventually becoming a detective with the Vancouver Police Department. After his retirement, he continued working on Donna and Timothy's case as a volunteer investigator with the Clark County Sheriff's Office. He said in 2016 that he has identified a person of interest he believes is responsible for the murders. Despite the passage of time, he still believes this person can be brought to justice. This is a case that is solvable, he told ABC6 News. Something can be done, and we're just trying to get this case into the court system. Despite having nine massive binders of evidence and a potential suspect, there is still not enough evidence to bring charges up against anyone and finally get justice for Donna, Timothy, and their family. Wally Steffen believes that there are members of the public who have the necessary information about the case to move it forward. Step up, make a statement, tell the truth, and help the prosecutor do his job, he asked of them. Fourteen-year-old Carla Atkins and sixteen-year-old Vicki Stout lived in a mobile home just outside the small town of Dover, Tennessee, with their mother, four brothers, and two other sisters. The sisters were half-siblings, who had the same mother. Vicki's father, Leland Stout, had been murdered just a year after she was born. His roommate had stabbed Leland to death because he had been singing and keeping him awake. On the afternoon of September 17, 1980, the sisters rode the bus home from school and decided to walk down State Route 79 to an establishment called The Furnace, which was less than a mile away from their home. The Furnace was a restaurant, a bait shop, and a convenience store, and Carla and Vicky went there to buy snacks. After they left the store, witnesses saw them as they were talking to a man in a blue truck. They were never seen alive again after that sighting and their mother, Margie, reported them missing to the police after they failed to return home. It was out of character for Carla and Vicky to go off on their own, but they were still initially categorized as runaways by the authorities after they were reported missing. 
Their family continued searching for them for the next two and a half weeks. On October 5th, two hikers were walking along an old logging trail in what is now known as the Between the Lakes National Recreation Area. They discovered Vicky and Carla's bodies buried in shallow graves, 75 feet apart from each other. Autopsies would reveal that each of them had been shot in the head with a shotgun. It appeared the girls had been killed where they were found. Canine units were brought in to search the area where the remains were found. Investigators tried to connect the case to others in nearby areas, and more than 30 potential suspects were identified. However, the case remained unsolved. In 2015, 35 years after Vicki and Carla were killed, District Attorney Ray Crouch reopened the case, conducting new interviews and asking the FBI for assistance because Carla and Vicki's bodies had been found on federal land. The sketches of the man witnesses saw in the bloop truck talking to Carla and Vicki were also released to the public, along with a new sketch developed by the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, which shows what the man the witnesses saw may look like having aged 35 years. In 2016, Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam announced a reward of $5,000 for information that led to the arrest and conviction of the sister's killer. Carla and Vicki are buried next to each other in the Standing Stone Cemetery. Despite the ongoing efforts of numerous agencies, decades after Carla and Vicki's deaths, the case remains unsolved. Their sister, Patricia Gordon, however, has not lost faith that whoever took her sisters from her will one day be held accountable. They will get their justice someday. They'll get what's coming to them, whether it be in my lifetime or not, she said in 2018.